So I'm here today to talk about something that is clearly near and dear to all of our hearts, happiness, right? But what I want to do is approach it from a somewhat unusual perspective by asking the question of whether or not can there be a dark side of happiness? Is this a really odd question to ask? Am I a hater of happiness? Where are we going here? So we know that happiness is something that's gained a lot of recent attention. We see an explosion in the scientific study of happiness, as well as this overwhelming surge of attention in the pop culture media. We see books like The Happiness Project, Stumbling on Happiness, Authentic Happiness, The How of Happiness, The Art of Happiness, and a recent favorite of mine that I discovered, Get Happy Today with a Dolphin <laughs> Emerging Out of the Ocean. <laughs> Not quite sure how that works. Um, we also see this evident in the pharmaceutical industry, right? We see a like almost skyrocketing rate in prescriptions for antidepressants ranging from Prozac to Paxil to Cymbalta. So where are we going here? Is there some basis for this upward trend towards greater and greater happiness. And I would suggest, well, yes, there is some scientific basis that psychologists have found that suggests why positive emotion and happiness might actually be good for us. What do we think these things are? Well, we know that they build vital social bonds. It enhances creative thinking and also builds physical immunity to stressors. So should we just continue on this upward and upward trend towards greater happiness or should we stop, take a step back and ask ourselves, is happiness unconditionally always a good thing? I'm going to suggest, as the title of my talk indicates, yes. That like everything in life, there's two sides to every story. And happiness, why should it be any exception? And so what I want to do now is turn ourselves to thinking about this other side of happiness, or what some people like to think about as a dark side of happiness. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I'm going to take us on a journey into the dark side. Um, and I'm going to start by echoing, I think a lot of us like to echo, some of the ancient observations that philosophers knew way long before us and were just sort of catching up. So here's a quote by Aristotle who had some really keen insights into the human condition about emotion. He said, getting angry or sad is easy, and anyone can do it. But doing it in the right amount, at the right time, and in the right way is not easy, nor can everyone do it. I want to pluck out three themes here and take them on our journey into the dark side of happiness. I want to look at the amount of happiness, the timing of happiness, and the way in which we become happy. So let's start to take these themes into the dark side, um, looking at the amount, the time, and the way. I'm going to start with this first theme, looking at the amount. Here I want to ask the question, can there ever be too much of a good thing? Well, we know that the relationship between happiness and well-being or health is not a straightforward line. In fact, it seems to look somewhat more like an upside down or inverted view. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here we have a graph with health up here and happiness down here. So what we've seen so far is that, well, higher doses of happiness seem to be associated with greater health, okay. But as we start to pass a critical tipping point, this truism about happiness seems to unwind, where we start to see that the benefits unravel and they actually become associated with <laughs> negative consequences. And so what might some of these be? Well, on the one hand, we see that extreme degrees of happiness are actually associated with less creativity and a greater increase in a host of negative behaviors, ranging from risk-taking to alcohol and drug use and an increased risk of mental illness. And in my lab, we've looked at this latter cause of mental illness, specifically finding that extreme degrees of happiness are associated with an increased risk for and diagnosis of mania, which is a component of bipolar disorder. Let me give you a preview into what that looks like here. I find this quote really, really uh, appropriate. So here we see, the case for the dangers of positive emotions is made most straightforwardly by individuals with mania. Their joy is infectious, their optimism and self-confidence unbounded. Um, 
One manic may give away his life savings on a whim, while another joyfully drives 100 miles an hour to a sexual liaison with a potentially dangerous stranger. So I hope what I've showed you here is that the relationship between happiness and health is not straightforward, and in fact suggests at some point there may be too much of a good thing when we get past that critical threshold. Okay, so now I want to look at the timing. Is happiness always a good thing in every context? Or can there be a wrong time for happiness? And here I want to give two examples where I think it may be the case. One of them looks at competition. So we find that situations in which people are competitive, um, so imagine you're trying to win an uh, athletic tournament or beat someone on a game of chess. Do you want to be feeling happy? What would you think? What might be the appropriate emotion you want to feel? Well, what researchers find is that the more happy you feel, the less well you perform on these situations, and that people who perform better on these situations are actually angrier. So happiness is not always adaptive in these situations. My lab has looked at the context of loss. So here we find we bring people into the lab, we have them watch sad movies depicting things of death and dying. It's a nice lab to be in. Um, we also have them interact with strangers, um, as well as intimate romantic partners, sharing times of extreme suffering and loss. And what we find is that those individuals who continue to remain happy at high levels in these situations are at greater risk for emotional impairment, as well as show poorer functioning in their everyday lives. So this suggests that you don't want to be happy all the time, and you don't want to be happy in every context. In sum, the timing of happiness is really crucial. And so now I want to conclude with our final question here, looking at the way uh, in which we become happy. Specifically, I want to think about, can there be wrong ways to pursue happiness? Since we all want to become happy, we're reading these books, we're thinking, seeing it in the you know, media, are there actually wrong ways to pursue this path? So does anyone recognize what this is here? OK, good. So this is the Declaration of Independence. And it seems ingrained in us as Americans that we hold true, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right, so this is sort of one of our core cultural values, but yet should we always be pursuing happiness? What do you think I'm gonna say here? No, <laughs> and why? So there's some really, really provocative work coming out by Iris Mouse, a psychologist, suggesting that there's a group of us out here, perhaps some in the audience today, who highly value happiness, that this is a core value in their life. They expend efforts to become happy, they consider it a core component of who they are, and they put just enormous amounts of their mental attention towards ways to become happy. How can I become happier? What can I do? Where can I go? What do you think happens with these people? Well, they're actually setting a very high happiness standards, right, for where they ought to be, for where that path towards ultimate happiness should lie. And what happens when we set up high standards or high expectations? We often become disappointed, because we usually are not meeting standards when they're very high, and this applies even to happiness. Um, and this is especially evident in contexts that are positive or pleasant, so situations in where we expect to experience some degree of happiness. So this paradoxical effect is that there's people who value happiness, they set up high standards. By doing so, they end up actually feeling disappointed, and as a result, they feel less happiness. So it's those who try to be happy are those who actually can set themselves up to become less happy. And we've seen this not only that people report less happiness, but they also show increased symptoms of depression. And in recent work, we found they show increased symptoms of mania, a component of bipolar disorder, um, having this zest or almost obsession with the pursuit of happiness. And so in many ways, this harkens back to ancient you know, observations that people have seen years before a lot of us psychologists got on board with the happiness train which is that those only are happy who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness. And so I just want to conclude with a few take-home themes. 
One of them is that I don't think happiness is bad by any means. Um, I think it's a really crucial component of our daily lives. It's what gives us meaning and gives us a reason to thrive. But the second message I want to take home today is that happiness needs to be treated carefully. It needs to be experienced in moderation, so not too much. It needs to be experienced in the right context. So timing is crucial, and we shouldn't strive to be happy all the time, every time. Um, and then finally, as you saw that quote there, it's really important to not be so focused on becoming happy, but instead, as many sort of ancient Buddhist traditions really strive, to just accept your current emotion state as it is, accept whatever degree of happiness you may have in the moment, and just let it come as it will. So with that, I hope that I've provided a sort of broader portrait of happiness is this really fascinating but complex phenomena that indeed has two sides and possibly even a dark side. And so with that, I just want to thank you. Um, if you want to shoot me a note, I'm right there. Thanks.